It's the Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilbert coming to you from Baltimore. Will the small Central American country of El Salvador be the next country to shift to the right? This is the question that many Latin America observers are asking in the wake of Sunday's presidential election in El Salvador. Najib Bukele, a wealthy businessman of Palestinian descent, won an overwhelming majority on Sunday with 54 percent of the vote. He once was a member of the FMLN, the leftist guerrilla group that turned into a political party with the signing of the peace accords in 1992. However, after being expelled from the FMLN in 2017, Bukele joined a right-wing party known as Ghana. Carlos Callejas, the candidate of the far-right Nationalist Republican Alliance Party, won only 32 percent of the vote, and Foreign Minister Hugo Martinez of the FMLN got only 14 percent. Joining me now to analyze El Salvador's presidential election results is Alexis Strombelis. Alexis is the organizational coordinator for the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, also known as CISPIS. She joins us now from San Salvador, where she observed the presidential election. Thanks, Alexis, for, having, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So, Najib Bukele is only 37 years old and first stepped onto the national scene in 2015 when he was elected as mayor of San Salvador, the capital. How is it possible that such a political newcomer won the presidency with such a large margin? It's a great question. I think the answers are really several fold. First, I think, you know, Najib Bukele himself is a very, very savvy very media savvy politician. You know, he's known here as sort of a virtual candidate, and there was really a lot of questions about how his online popularity and his really strong social media presence and strong social media following would translate into actual votes. Because, you know, the political movement that he started called New Ideas or Nuevas Ideas, you know, did not get registered in time to be a political party. And so he jumped on the bandwagon of a smaller right wing party, Ghana, the National Unity Alliance, which is known for being extremely corrupt and opportunistic. Um, so there was a real question about whether his sort of virtual presence would translate into really much of a political ground game, given that he's, his own party doesn't have any of that kind of established base. And I think what we saw with the elections is that clearly it did translate into people going out to vote for him. And I think the other real, you know, factor in this election and Naib's victory is that for the last 10 years, the Salvadoran right wing has had a really merciless, well-funded, successful campaign to really diminish the FMLN as a leftist government in the eyes of the population in terms of utilizing the, the control that they still have over other state institutions like the Supreme Court, the Attorney General's office, using their control over, you know, obviously the financial sector and the media sector to really, you know, wear down popular support for the FMLN. And they obviously were doing that for what they thought was going to be their own political advantage. And so naive candidacy coming when it did really took advantage of, you know, what the right wing's media war had been for the last 10 years. And he was able to sort of really jump on top of that and try to, con you know, falling into that same narrative that both political parties were the same um, and it was time for something new. And obviously, you know, the right wing has in fact been pretty effective in reining in some of the more transformational changes that the FMLN had tried to enact in El Salvador. And really, you know, a lot of people's lives have you know, remained with some of the similar challenges that they have. And that was something that Riley, uh, Naive Kelly was able to capitalize on. Now, the FMLN managed to win the presidency for the first time back in 2009 uh, with Mauricio Funes, and then it won again, I think, in 2014 with Salvador Sanchez Seren. Uh, but then it started losing, uh, you know, especially the 2018 municipal elections. But uh, so I'm wondering, you know, in addition to, of course, you're saying that, you know, the, that the, uh, the conservative forces in El Salvador managed to, to put obstacles in the path of the FMLN, but uh, is there anything about the FMLN itself and its own dynamic and its own work that uh, might have uh, put it in a difficult position at the moment? It's a great question, and I think it's definitely one that, you know, everyone here sort of on part of left and progressive social and political movements is definitely asking themselves right now. I think, you know, the FMLN has, un has been a rather 
ideologically diverse and has had a spectrum um, of people who, some of whom, you know, are more willing to cooperate with neoliberal economic policies and try to stay in the good graces of the United States. In some ways, you saw from some voices more of an accommodation to to the system, as it were. And I think you both saw some from some social movement organizations on the left, labor movements and and things like that, you know, some generally valid and very necessary critiques about the fact that the FMLN was no not as much focused on transforming the economic system as it had been previously as an opposition party. And then at the same time you also saw that internal dynamic within the party and between its supporters and the party leadership also being something that the right wing was able to capitalize in, in on in the media to make it sort of seem like everyone was disaffected with the FMLN. So I think that's obviously an internal challenge that that they have to deal with and I think left parties across the continent are dealing with. And at the same time, I think we've seen in the last few months a really sharp turnaround um, in terms of people who had maybe, you know, wanted to send a message of protest to the FMLN during the midterm elections that they weren't happy with, you know, different decisions the party were making. And their choice of how to do that was to not go out and vote in the midterms. You saw a lot of re- energizing amongst um, people who've historically been the FMLN's party base when the right wing came into an even more majority control in the legislative assembly, because they very quickly moved to put forward legislation that would potentially privatize water in El Salvador, which is one of the sort of historic struggles that the environmental movement, the communities, campesino movements, labor movements, the FMLN have been really united in. And so this moment of realization of what it might mean if the right wing were to come back to power and already the power that they had regained really shifted the dynamics. You start to see a lot more energy um, in terms of supporting the FMLN. Um, and I think moving forward, that's something that I think we can really expect to sort of see mm. that those sectors have been sort of a historic base on the left and the FMLN find themselves again together in the opposition. Well, actually, that's what I'm also wondering is what uh, can we expect from Nayib Bukele um, as president? I mean, he's part of Ghana, uh, which is a right wing or center right party. Um, do you expect him to govern from the right or uh, do you expect him to stick to some of his FMLN uh, origins? It's a great question. And I think he's been very deliberately vague throughout the entire campaign. He refused to participate in any of the public debates that were held. He very soon before the election finally released a government platform, and it was uh, came out pretty quickly that some of the, the parts of that platform had been, you know, lifted from academic papers and other things. So it really does remain very unclear what he stands for. Um, you know, he's sort of been able to position himself just as I'm not like everybody else, um, which sounds familiar to those of us in the U.S., and yet, you know, a tremendous amount of inconsistency and just lack of clarity or commitments in terms of any kind of particular platform commitments that that really carry any weight. I think given the fact that the right-wing parties together, of which Ghana is one, as you mentioned, have basically a supermajority in the legislative assembly, he is going to face, this, and he himself doesn't have his own party in the legislative assembly, that he's going to face an incredibly difficult situation if he does try to enact any kind of progressive policies, he faces a huge and very well-organized opposition, including the party that he just got elected as president, um, who just elected him as president. So I think he's going to face a tremendous amount of contradictions should he try to, you know, continue some of the things that did make him popular as an FMLN mayor. I think he's in for a very rude awakening of about the, the legislative assembly and the power structures in El Salvador. Um, and I think, you know, he will also be, for that reason, very vulnerable to the United States' influence, which continues to, um, you know, loom over El Salvador, um, especially now with the sort of heightened aggression that we're seeing from the Trump administration. And it's very, very unclear how he's going to respond to that. Okay. Well, I'm sure we're going to come back to you on this. Um, I was speaking to Alex Trumbelis, Organization Coordinator for CISPIS, the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. Thanks again, Alexis, for having joined us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.